I'm very pleased to introduce Al Harberger. He's been a kind of a true legend and intellectual leader within the University of Chicago as well as worldwide. And, and he's had a lasting impact in his, um, it's a lasting impact that, you know, that his research has had on Latin American governments, economies, and the like. His influence sets the stage for a, set the stage for a generation of, um, of, a young econ of economists serving in various private governmental capacities as well as uh, a, a academia who used to use his tools and other tools to tackle the challenges of uh, economic crises. Al taught at the University of Chicago uh, full-time between 1953 and 1982 and part-time until 1991. I was lucky enough to interact with him in the la latter portion of this, uh, of this time span. As well as making fundamental contributions to the field of public finance, he has, has used his economic insights and analyses in providing policy advice to a wide range of Latin American countries. Moreover, he's always had a big influence through his training of students at the University of Chicago who, who have ended up serving in important capabilities. So the plan is to have um, Al talk for, say, around 20 or so minutes, and then we will open things up for, for the audience for, uh, uh, for a Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on my departure from Chicago, I gave a series of three public lectures, and one of them was entitled, My Life with the Real Exchange Rate, <laughs> <laughs> which began with my dissertation. <laughs> but uh, so I picked the topic, Some Real Exchange Rate, rate Stories from Latin America. And I'm going to read this in order to obey the time limit as best I can. Uh, I, and for that reason, it's on PowerPoint, so you can follow me in two senses rather than just one, by ear and by eye. OK. Real exchange rate analysis really dates from the late 60s and early 70s. Its distinctive feature is separating out two distinct price levels, those of tradables and non-tradables. Of course, most actual final goods are mixtures of the two, but that doesn't modify the fact that most countries have little or no influence on the FOB or CIF prices of their tradables. When real exchange rate adjustments are required, Tradables prices move up and down with the nominal rate if the nominal rate is fixed. RER adjustments occur by movements in prices of non-tradables, uh, and that's the story. Uh, in theoretical treatments, uh, the RER is often defined just as the price of tradables relative to that of non-tradables, PT over PNT. But in practical work, we can't get PNT very readily, so we try to get an international price index P star T uh, and uh, multiply it by the nominal exchange rate. That gives us a FO, CIF price of tradables, and we divide that by a general price index like the uh, CPI or the GDP deflator. But the RER is really a very complicated and tricky thing. Its equilibrium moves around by, as, as lots of things change. Tariffs, subsidies, all other kinds of trade restrictions and taxes, capital inflows, remittances, world price movements of individual tradables, technological influences of all kinds. It's a very complicated, endogenous variable in the economy. It has a life of its own. Uh, changes in any of these things cause the equilibrium RER to change. And it's the big job, analytically, of the RER is to bring about equilibrium in the country's trade and payments and those trade and payments include foreign, include foreign aid, capital flows, even inflows and outflows of the central bank's own reserves. So 
One very important insight, a capital inflow spent on tradables should generate no change in the equilibrium RER, while a big inflow spent on non-tradables should produce a big appreciation. So you've got two different effects on the RER depending on what that flow is being spent on, and we have to watch that because different times have 80% one way, and other times will be 80% the other way. Lesson number one in real exchange rate economics is that it takes a real instrument to have a lasting effect on the equilibrium RER. First story here. In El Salvador in 88, we had a team trying to diagnose the country's problems. We met with presidential candidates, their economic teams, and representatives of all the main sectors. We were really struck by the pressures that came from the agricultural sector, mainly coffee and sugar farmers. They complained about the central bank. Why was the central bank giving them so much trouble, they asked, by keeping the exchange rate at five colones, when just by a stroke of the pen, they could convert our misery into prosperity just shifting that exchange rate from five colonies to eight or ten. We repeatedly explained to them that the RER was low because of inflows of foreign aid and emigrant remittances that totaled more than 10% of Salvador's GDP. They seemed to agree, nodding their heads glumly. But at the next meeting, they were back at square one, calling for a devaluation to eight or ten. We told them that a higher real price of the dollar would surely come if foreign aid and emigrant remittances were cut in half. But we couldn't think of any other way <laughs> that you could engineer such a rise uh, in the RER. This brings up really a question of whether a central bank can target the real exchange rate. The answer is yes. But not surprisingly, it takes one or more real instruments to affect the equilibrium RER. Brazil succeeded quite well in managing the real exchange rate during the Brazilian miracle period, 68 to 78. So too did Chile during the recovery from the debt crisis, 85 to 89. Brazil did this by working with trade restrictions. Chile worked with real capital flows. Brazil's central bank would set the nominal rate so that the RER was in its target range. This could be frustrated, however, by people selling too many dollars to the central bank, generating undesired price level increases. But when this appeared to be happening, the central bank, or the government itself, would peel away some trade restrictions, of which there were initially plenty, generating new demand for dollars and preventing undesired RER appreciation. We economists all applauded as trade restrictions disappeared while RER targets were met. But we didn't applaud when, after the 74 oil boom, dollars became scarce and their price wanted to rise. Brazil's answer was to put some trade restrictions back on. The RER targeting worked, but we thought it would have been better for them to let the RER find a new higher equilibrium rather than put on trade restrictions. In Chile's case, the recovery from the debt crisis was helped by a real exchange rate that gave good incentives to exports. This was achieved by controlling the outflow of dollars by way of an auction mechanism. The critical source of dollar demand was the purchase of debt instruments of Chilean private banks, which initially were selling at a big discount in the secondary market in New York. 
The banks themselves could not legally buy back their own discounted debt, but speculators could, and their demand was threatening to create a big spike in the price of the dollar here in Chile. The central bank prevented this basically by spreading that demand over time. It instituted an auction system, I think every two weeks, at which the central bank would auction off the rights to buy foreign exchange for this purpose. By the way, central bank made profits on those auctions. <laughs> uh, central bank, in turn, set the amount of dollars to be put on auction at a level that would keep the RER in its desired range. The system worked well, but the discount on the Chilean bank debt gradually eroded as the outstanding stock of such debt was drawn down. By the time Chile's democracy was restored, the auction system was no longer a useful instrument. But the new authorities liked the idea behind the auction system and sought the same objective by standard sterilized intervention. This entailed not printing pesos, but raising them in the local capital market by selling bonds. These bonds were indexed to the price level and yielded about 7% in real terms. The resulting dollars were treated as regular international reserves and were earning in New York nominal rates of 2 to 3% in dollars. The result was large and continuing central bank losses, which in the end led to the abandonment of the RER target. So, now the great debt crisis, early 1980s. This is a huge topic so I will not try to go into detail about that, but give you a general idea. It all started with the oil price boom of 79. The populous oil price countries spent all or more than all of the proceeds of that bonanza. But Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states sucked that money away in the big international banks. These banks had to find places where they could profitably lend that money. That's when they, quote, discovered some newly liberalized economies in Latin America. These banks competed among themselves to market lo new loans in Argentina, Peru, Chile, and Uruguay for that at that time. But Mexico, even though an oil <laughs> bonanza country borrowed more than the oil bonanza itself, much more, and it was then put in the category with Argentina, Peru, Chile, and Uruguay. By the way, at that time, the joke was you couldn't find a hot good hotel, a top hotel room in Santiago, because all these international bank representatives were trying to shove loans down the Chilean banks, had all those rooms. <laughs> <laughs> the borrowing phase brought prosperity to all the recipient countries. The dollar became cheap in real terms because it was abundant, and non-tradable prices and real wages rose. But when the borrowing flow tailed off, that was enough to require a big real exchange rate adjustment. Wages and non-tradable prices had to fall in real terms. Instead, real GDP and real imports fell sharply, and unemployment jumped in all the affected countries. In Chile, unemployment went from under 10% in June 81 to over 25% a year later. The severity of this adjustment was largely due to its fixed exchange rate. The real exchange rate was trying to rise by a downward pressure on real wages and NT prices. But deflation did not work well. Milton Friedman used to say that making major adjustments by way of deflation was like cutting off a dog's tail an inch at a time, while a flexible rate would cut it off all at once. 
Despite its suffering the biggest fall in GDP, however, Chile was the first country to reach and surpass its pre-crisis peak of GDP. This was without doubt due to the high quality of the economic policy packages during the last half of the 1980s. But before I leave this aspect, I want to mention that there are cases that place limits on the central bank's power to affect the real exchange rate. I call it the reflux problem. When Chile's central bank issued its indexed bonds at 7% and sent the dollars to New York, it could have happened that an equal or almost equal amount of capital would flow back to Chile, maybe even to buy the same 7% bonds. A 30% or even a 50% reflux still leaves the central bank with influence on the RER. An 80% or 90% reflux would certainly be enough to kill the idea. The degree of integration with world capital markets thus governs the influence that the central bank has on the RER. But please note that even the fullest possible integration does not keep the RER from having huge variations due to many other causes. Argentina in the 90s. The story of Argentina in the 90s makes me think of a Greek tragedy. Each step inevitably followed from the previous one, right up to the final downfall. It all started with an original sin, uncontrolled inflation during the 80s as the country fumbled in its response to the debt crisis. Two major attempts were made to stop this inflation. The Austral Plan in 85 and the Primavera Plan in 88. In both cases, the exchange rate was used as the nominal anchor with a promise that it would stay fixed for a long time. In fact, the fix was only transitory as there was no serious attack on the fiscal deficits that were fueling the inflation. So the public ended up being deceived by the promise exchange stability and inflation ballooned to over 3,000% in 89. By that time, practically everything was being priced in dollars, even haircuts, taxi rides, and other non-tradable goods and services. So the NT, the ratio of NT prices to T prices could not be played with. They were right there all in dollars in the market. This meant that the government on starting a new stabilization plan could not set the real exchange rate at any level different from the one that it had. It had to take the existing dollar denominated price relationships as the starting point. Domingo Cavallo was artful in creating a convertibility law that at least did generate public confidence in the new stabilization plan. Because this time it was Congress that set the exchange rate and only Congress could change it. This idea worked well, maybe even too well. For at the new fixed exchange rate, many Argentines brought back money that had fled the country in the 1980s, and foreigners began pouring new capital into the country, buying up public utilities and other companies. This capital inflow brought about a boom in the economy with rising real wages, rents, and other non-tradable prices. Now came the next step in the Greek tragedy. The inflow of capital worked fine for a couple of years, but once it fell off, the equilibrium RER had to rise, but, but with a fixed exchange rate, that meant deflation. National unemployment moved up from 6 and 7% in 91 and 92, to 9.3 by October 93 and 12.2 by October 94. The pressure for RER adjustment was present, therefore, 
well ahead of the so-called Tequilazo, a December 1994 crisis triggered by capital flight from Mexico. Argentina actually did well in coping with the <clears throat> Tequilazo, a huge loss of about half its international reserves, but suffering only a rather minor drop in its broad money supply. This was done through artful monetary management plus significant help from the IMF and the World Bank. But unemployment persisted, ranging around 50 or over 15% for the rest of the decade. This signaled a continued real exchange rate disequilibrium reminiscent of England in the 1920s. The difficulty of devaluing the currency was the product of the convertibility law. The starting RER under that law could not be managed due to Argentina's past behavior. Nor could the ensuing RER appreciation in the first couple of years be prevented as it was a direct result of the confidence in the new system bringing back money coming from abroad. But when the need arose for the RER to increase, Deflation was the only available route under convertibility. High unemployment prevailed through the rest of the decade right up to the devaluation of January 2002. Many economists called for more fiscal restraint at that time, but we should realize that that would have meant a still further dose of deflation. I think the primary this Disequilibrium was the RER disequilibrium. I can't end this talk without bringing in two experiences from outside the region, each of them carrying a big RER lesson. Between 96 and 03, China had a fixed exchange rate with the dollar. The country had huge export surpluses, which resulted in a doubling of its base money as the money multiplier increased by 50% at that time, broad money, M2, tripled. Yet despite that tripling, the CPI went up in seven years from 115 to 117, less than 2% increase in seven years. <laughs> what had happened was that the central bank had played by the rules of the fixed exchange rate game. It had freely bought those export dollars. The ensuing increase in M2 that would normally take place would lead, or would normally, that did take place, would normally lead to a price level rise and an RER appreciation. But this did not happen for one simple reason. People were, were happy to keep those big increases in M2 that the central bank made. Uh, <clears throat> So, the M2 was expanded, but the price level did not go up as we sort of would, expected, would have expected. I called it sterilization by the people. My lesson from the experience is that if the People's Bank of China had followed a monetary rule, generous monetary rule, increasing M at the same rate as GDP, 10% per year. A deflation would have been called for to bring price level down from 117 to 80. Not a good idea. My second example is Russia between January 2000 and January 2010. I was there both times. And on each occasion, the dollar rate was a little over 28 rubles. Yet in the interim, Russia's CPI had tripled, more than tripled. <clears throat> this is another case where the central bank bought the proceeds of an export boom. But this tripling, a natural result of that purchase, happened in spite of increased reserve requirements, Central bank started paying interest on excess reserves. The government loaded up the government deposits at the central bank. 
there was a big buildup of foreign balances in Russian oil fund, and Russia's real GDP almost doubled in the interim. It is quite clear that the tripling of Russia's CPI was not a standard inflation <laughs> fueled by government deficits financed by printing money. Instead, it was just a real exchange rate adjustment, which should not seem as a problem per se. The reality, they should have, they, well, they did end up accepting it, but they shouldn't have been complaining about inflation. They should have seen that this was a necessary consequence of the big com commodity price boom that they had. One alternative to the price level more than tripling would have been to implement a 3% inflation target and let the nominal exchange rate fall from 28 to a little under 12. That's what I'm saying. If they had been following a 3% target, they would have had to let the nominal rate fall from 28 to 12. I don't know of anybody in Russia who would have suggested such a path even though, quote, in theory, it would have led to the same real equilibrium that we had in 2010. But as put in practice, it would have encountered the rigidities of def deflation throughout the tradable sector of the economy. Adjustments may have been smooth in industries like mining, where economic rents account for a large fraction of receipts but the rigidities would have been severe in activities like manufacturing, which was already a troubled sector in 2000. My conclusion from these exercises is that one should not follow any simple rule blindly. Guidelines like inflation targeting and the Taylor rule have positive effects, but there are situations in which they are simply not the right medicine. Thus, we have a choice. We can stick with the rule through thick and thin because we deeply distrust the decision makers. I think that's the only reason to stick thick and th through thick and thin to, a, to a, a simple rule. If we have some faith in the decision makers applying good economics, in diagnosing important shocks and other developments, we should allow them appropriate discretion rather than follow any rule with total strictness. It's wise to have a sensible rule for normal times, but it's also wise to know how and when to break it. I personally believe that economic policy has greatly improved in most countries during my professional lifetime. I, I attribute this to advances of our economic understanding and to the application of sound economics in diagnosing problems and seeking re remedies. I give great credit to the staffing of central banks and economic ministries with well-trained professionals and also to the multiple roles played by the IMF, the World Bank, and other international organizations. I would especially call attention to the hidden role that these organizations have played in giving wide international experience and years of on-the-job training to many who have later become and later will become policymakers in developing countries. So uh, let's go back to March 1991 in Argentina. Yeah. Was there any way to avoid the tragedy? I don't think so. I, that's why I called it a Greek tragedy. That you, there was no way, he couldn't have set, two, if he set two to one, <laughs> it would just be <laughs> uh, 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 that, that uh, everything we called one new peso <laughs> would be called <laughs> a half a new peso, I mean, it would be called two new pesos. That, that would just, everything would, all relative prices would be the same. So uh, I think it was very sad. Uh, 
It could have been that in the subsequent sale, in, in the stage two, when capital was flowing in, I don't think government could or should have tried to stop the Argentinos from taking money back from Uruguay and New York. But the Spaniards were pouring in and they were buying corporations, some of which were actually being sold by the government. <laughs> okay, suppose the government hadn't made those sales. There would have been less of an inflow. There may have been other problems with efficiency of the enterprises, goodness knows what, but the inflow of capital that caused the appreciation of the currency which later left you with a huge deflation problem, that would have been smaller. Uh, just just to follow, follow up on that in the first place, thank you for a, a great lecture. Um, the, um, what if Argentina had sort of a lender of last resort as uh, southern European countries had and you had a Mario Draghi saying, whatever it takes. Uh, I know there are all kinds of problems with that, but st still the question is uh, looking forward. In the case of Argentina, at this very moment, mm -hmm. people don't believe in the peso. So you start thinking, what should I advise to, to Argentina? Just have a peso float in exchange rate. Doesn't mean much or anything. Uh, so you, again, you start thinking about, well, maybe the country should start pegging in some fashion. But we saw it just breaking down in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Could it help us? At one time, some, some years ago in the 90s, some people came up with the idea, say, well, maybe we can reach an agreement with the Fed. I know it's very unlikely. But just uh, how, do you, how would you think of something wow. where you have some uh, lender of last resort it, out there? This, you can crack your head on this one. But the problem is, that if a country like Panama has a nice steady flow of foreign exchange from something like the canal, fixing the exchange rate is beautiful. Everybody benefits and there seem to be no RER problems. But when your principal exports are going this way and that way, or if you have big swings like this in inflows and outflows of capital, then you're going to have real exchange rate equilibrium changing. And it doesn't only change in the happy direction. That there's the unhappy direction is there. Now, Norway found a wonderful solution. The subsource resources in Norway belong to the people. And the wise government at that time says, they are capital, right? They are stock of capital. They're not income. So when we take the oil up and we sell it, it's still capital. So we invested in New York at 7% real, <laughs> and we repatriate the proceeds year by year. And they even average in the repatriation. They average. <laughs> they don't follow all the ups and downs in, in the earnings of, 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 of the oil fund. They average out as many universities do in handling their endowments, same thing. Uh, that's the, a true solution, you know. Now, that solution is very easy if the government owns the resources to begin with. But if you have 100,000 cafetaleros in Brazil, <laughs> how are you going to do that, you see? You, you, if you're going to, they're going to make them have the money up but now, there's another story. Back, we, we wondered about the, uh, how did Central America get to do so well for so long with fixed exchange rates? They kind of broke in the 80s with their long fixed exchange rate tradition. Well, one time, one son of a cafetalero told me, he said, oh, it was very easy. My father always kept his money in Miami. 
So <laughs> when, whenever the kind of coffee boom, <laughs> the Miami account went up, and whenever there was a coffee bust, the Miami account went down. And he was doing a coffee fund <laughs> at the familial level. <laughs> and that, that, that apparently is the best explanation for the successful management of the real exchange rate problem in Central America for so many decades. Following up on the same issue a little, um, how about when you have big corporations, and I don't want to sound like Christina Kirchner, but how about when you have big international companies where the flow of capital may go both ways without even recording it? Mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of El Salvador, it seems quite easy. People personally would take the, send the money to Miami like we have seen in the whole region for many years. But when you have in-house big companies mm -hmm. that do the same thing, how do you handle that? Well, f for the time being, I, I would treat it as an exogenous fact that if you try to offset, I mean, there's always a way that you, you can, the central bank can do sterilized intervention to oppose such a, a move. And uh, that is there for, for uh, is that potential is present for lots of ways. And I might use this opportunity to say that uh, I was uh, not a, a, an ardent proponent, I wouldn't say that. But at the time when the Central Bank of Chile was making all those losses, it had huge international reserves in New York. And the question was, did they have to treat all of them under the rule of a practically immediate liquidity necessity? Why, I asked, don't you invest this like Harvard invests its endowment and earn 7%? on the reserves. Of course, there's more risk, and the, the, the authorities were very, very cherry about risk, especially since something had happened in copper earlier that had caused a lot of trouble. But uh, at, at a purely intellectual level, I think that uh, countries having substantial assets abroad is not a dumb idea, and it's especially not dumb the higher is the real rate of return that those assets are generating. And when you have that, you have more flexibility and more possibility to compensate uh, mo unexpected movements which are going to come from out of left field or right field or out of the sky in a, in a comet or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, that's just the thought. So, I like very much your idea that we should be using these um, simple policy rules in normal times and maybe only exercise the discretion in very special times. But I'm, but I'm a little bit worried about this in practice in a sense that once the governments understand they have this discretion in abnormal times, then who gets to define what the, what the normal time is again and will they hand back the discretion in the, in the more normal times? It seems like it's, it does take a lot of faith in, 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 uh, in governmental policymakers to uh, make that call. Well, I can tell you, I mean, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Friedman's urging a 5% monetary expansion rule was not based on his economic analysis. It was based on his total distrust <laughs> of what those people would do. And uh, what 
I, I see is that uh, uh, my, my first reaction to that over many years, I used to say, look, uh, follow the, have a demand function for money. See where that demand function is moving. When it shifts, build in the shift there. If you know about the reason for the shift, good. If you say this seems to be a permanent shift, take that. And give people the money that they are demanding. If they demand more money, print. If they demand less money, suck it back up. And I think that is what I learned from Friedman. <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, so now, is that discretion? Good question. But then you come to things like, uh, I mean, Paulson, Bernanke, and uh, uh, Geisner. I think we ought to have the hugest statues to those three guys. That they saved the world economy over one weekend. And doing something that was totally unprecedented, but very sound, in my opinion, in terms of the economic needs of the moment. They diagnosed the situation. And basically, I think the key feature in my head is the bailout of AIG. AIG was insuring all these packages, and which were held by <laughs> banks and central banks, and goodness knows what, all over the world. And if it went bust, <laughs> there would be a real implosion, and, and well, what I take it, ha it happened was they mobilized all the forces they could, bailed out AIG, and prevented something that turned out to be a pretty tough recession, but they prevented that from being a very serious world depression. And I must say that may have influenced in part my <laughs> observations here. Carlo. Uh, thank you, Alito, for an outstanding lunch and lecture. Um, my question is the following. In, in practice, it is usually very difficult to recognize fast enough changes in real exchange rates that would require action by the authorities to maintain the uh, real rate at a certain, at a certain specific level. Um, wouldn't it be preferable, usually, to let non-tradable, uh, the tradable prices change to face shocks, both domestic and foreign, rather than uh, facing through it non-tradable prices? Uh, in other words, is it preferable to have flexible rates rather than fixed rates? Oh, absolutely. A absolutely. But that's what my, my Russian example was meant to say, you see, that it, it, it hold, if they held the price level constant in Russia, the, the nominal exchange rate would have to go down from 28 to 9. If they had a 3% Target inflation targeting rule over a decade, it would go down to 12. <laughs> and if you think about, I, when I think about that, I think maybe if they were all miners, you know, and they were, they had a huge cushion of, of economic rent that they could absorb, uh, th that would be fine. But if, if they're people who are uh, fighting uh, to keep alive, you know, manufacturers, farmers, goodness knows what, and pushing those prices down in, in this way uh, is, is different. And I, I think in terms, you guys are wonderful in, 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 in your lead-in question. In that same Russia paper, which happens to be in my website, in case anybody wants to look at it, I try to pursue the question, maybe the 
central banks of the world are doing something different. That maybe they sort of smell that there are two price levels. There's the tradable price level and the non-tradable price level. And obviously, the real exchange rate being the, somehow the ratio of the two, one of them has to go up relatively and one of them has to go down relatively at any moment. Let it be true that we won't let the one that's supposed to go down go down nominally that we will stop nominal deflation, whether it is a nominal deflation to go in tradables or a nominal deflation to go in non-tradables. This leads to a ratchet inflation over time. And I understand, I seem to remember that Julio Oliveira was talking about ratchet inflation years and years ago. I don't know if any of the Argentinos here may remember that, but I don't think he was talking in terms of the tradable, non-tradable particularly, but just in general sector-wise, that, that whatever sector was supposed to be going down, didn't want it to go down and then you go lot. But anyway, we made a little test to see over a number of countries which were having fixed or quasi-fixed exchange rates. And in how many of these did the did deflation supposed to happen? Okay, let's say there were 10 of them. And I think something like nine of the 10 in all 10, the nominal CPI didn't go down. So that's first of all. And we tried to back out a, non, a, a rough guess at what might be the non-tradable price level. And like in eight of the 10, that didn't go down either. <laughs> so there is some little hint that this area is an interesting area to have serious professional work. Go back and look. Try to, th th if it takes more, some new theoretical insights, to dig into them and so on. But a wonderful question.